Hi, I'm Carmelita Greco with the International Fine Art Fund. I'm here with Jerry Isley, collector, curator, director of the National Arts Group, and gallery owner. Influenced you or pulled you to work in the arts? I've always been drawn to beauty ever since I was a child and to the beauty of landscape and the beauty of sculptures and especially music. It was not until after I finished my master's degree at uh, Wheaton College in New Testament that I began to get more interested in the arts. Uh, just before I graduated, I was um, someone gave me a slip of paper and said there was a job working at a coffee house in Ocean City. This was in the late 60s. So I, it was a cooperative venture between the churches of the city and the Mayor's Youth Commission. There were a lot of gangs, there were a lot of hippies roaming on the streets. And there were a lot of poets that came in, painters and, and musicians, and I think that's where I really got hooked on it. Beside my uh, class that I've mentioned before to you where um, Dr. Young Kingma gave a special class for seniors and it was on art history. And the first day he was describing uh, medieval architecture and he was trying to describe flying buttresses and jumped up on top of the desk and started throwing his chalk around and from then on I was hooked. What style of art interests you? What, is there a certain era that you're drawn to or style or medium? Um, I'm a very undisciplined collector. Mm -hmm. Most collectors will discipline themselves to one artist or to one genre, but I can't be limited by that. I just like all kinds of things. And it's the same in music. In every era, there are some good uh, works of music and some that are not so good. It's the same in all the different periods of art history. I lean toward figurative art, but I love abstract art, especially and probably only if it's, it has depth where you can reach into something that shows mystery and not just flat surface. Um, I love sculpture. I lean toward figurative sculpture, but I love abstract sculpture too. I think sculpture is interesting because it uh, demands so much space around the object. It isn't just on a wall, like with a painting. In a Western painting with a perspective, you go in to the composition, like into the wall, behind the wall, to the landscape or whatever it is. But with sculpture, it's out in the room and it just, it creates a space about this big around it if it's a small sculpture. And it demands that and uh, I like the three-dimensionality of it. You mentioned earlier being drawn to beauty. Is there something within each piece of art that speaks beauty to you that pulls you to some level? Or, um, or form or, mm -hmm. or a, you know, a divine quality in the mm -hmm. work? It's more about the whole of the work. I, I can't always define what, it's, what is beautiful about it. I, you know, some beautiful paintings are really onks-ridden, mm -hmm. really dark. Mythologic. Well, myth is fine, but not creating an unreal world like, say, Thomas Kincaid. It's an unreal world that never existed. That's false. I like things that are truthful and beautiful at the same time. And there are a lot of different art forms and artists change and they can start out one way and end up in another medium, which is very difficult for an art dealer to deal with because your public gets used to your best period and then you decide to go off onto something else, it becomes really difficult um, to sell. Mm -hmm. And I guess my experience in the gallery prepared me more than anything to really understand what the needs of artists are because I had to deal with the commercial side. Uh, though there was a, a dividing wall between our nonprofit organization, the Washington Arts Group, and the gallery, uh, there were crossovers in the sense that I was able to emphasize to artists that professionalism and discipleship are equal. Those are equal things to look for and to develop. If you don't have the professionalism and you don't know how to create something, you will never express the, the numinous or the transcendent that God has created within the universe. So how does your work in the arts relate to your Christian faith? How does that come together for you? 
I don't find the, a dividing line. Mm -hmm. uh, my social conscience, which I developed really through beauty, through the arts, and working with artists in the inner city, is part of who I am. Um, I believe that uh, a Christian faith that is not incarnational in the world is not a Christian faith. And um, that's the way I've experienced my own life. My own personal story has had a lot of pain in it, and God has healed a lot of it, and I, I believe that it prepared me for doing what I do in the arts. For instance, the uh, Anacostia project and the, the Hope in Our City project at Union Station, which was seen by over two million people, uh, the center of that exhibition was Christ on the Cross. I have a, a picture of it here if you'd like to see it. And the cross is 23 feet high and is cantilevered coming over. And in African American culture, the cross isn't talked a lot about in the church, but it was a rallying point for the pain of slavery and people could identify with it. The corpus of that particular painting, you can't tell whether it's Middle Eastern, whether it's it's definitely not white, European, and blonde, but it's mm -hmm. kind of Middle Eastern, kind of, it's every man Christ. And I just believe that the cross is at the center of creation and the cross is at the center of human experience. That's why I planted the cross in the middle of Union Station. I thought if I can put it in a public place, I will do it. And I, I believe so deeply about uh, presenting work outside the museum, outside the church, outside of classroom, putting it out in a public space where people least expect it. This artist is Marguerite Slocum Quinn, and this, these, the figures for this painting were done in uh, Anacostia. These kids were either in the youth program or mentors in the Southeast White House communities, so she always paints from the community she's in and uses models for biblical narrative paintings. This was a pro-life statement, the unborn baby, the small baby. And uh, I had the most amazing experience with this when it was, it was still wet, and it was just dry, and our church was doing a joint uh, service for uh, parents who had lost children through, not necessarily abortion, but anything, any lost children. And they had a service, and they had, um, all kinds of things for each parent. It was the most moving thing I've ever been to. Anyway, the priest was a little nervous, but then he said, oh yeah, let's have it. And so we put it over this table with all these mementos they were giving to the parents. And they would walk by this when uh, they would pick it up and put it on a, they had a symbol for each child and put it on a tree, the end. And I watched this painting just, it was, like, it was the most extraordinary thing. I still see it, like all this, it just, it, it had this supernatural light that came down on that table from the painting, and it's, it's still there, it never yeah. left. It's, wow. He's African American, his name is Eglon Daly, and he was a Rastafarian and now is a believing Christian. And uh, he painted several paintings for the Anacostia Project. We commissioned him to do this, do these. This is the, called Passion. And <clears throat> both of these were actually done for a, a passion paper, that's the bottom. And uh, they're models from a church. There's a church, it's Anacostia Community Church, I believe. I'm not exactly sure. But Ricky Bolden, who's a former football player, started the church or became the, the minister there. And it's a uh, mixed congregation in Anacostia. Which is a rare. Very rare. Yeah. Extremely rare. This is another painting by Eglon Bailey, and again, this is Ricky Bolden, the uh, minister, pastor at this church, and uh, kids that are in the congregation. Ricky Bolden, uh, after he retired from football, started a, um, a house for kids to come to after school in Anacostia, and it's a Christian outreach. And uh, their congregation is really active in the community. It's a wonderful congregation and real reconciliation, real cooperation. And so we wanted to capture this to show the beauty and some of the wonderful things that happen in Anacostia because it has been such a, it's gotten such a bad rap for so long. 
uh, there's a lot going on. And when I was walking there one day, I went to the slave auction block and turned out there's a church, this church actually, that we'll look at next, the painting, uh, is right across from something called Freedom Square, which was the slave auction block. And I realized one day walking through the community, there had been millions of dollars poured into Anacostia. And as they said today, it was the crime capital of Washington. And really, it's only the outreach centers, the church and community outreach centers that have made a difference. And I'll tell that story when we get to this painting about the, the community itself. This is a painting by An Anthony Watkins of Anacostia. It's 14th and U Street. And this is St. Philip's Episcopal Church. When this painting was done, we knew nothing about this church and very little about the square. But we had heard that this was called Freedom Square. The people in Anacostia just ignore it. They don't even call it Freedom Square. And all the roads stop around it. And it was where the slave auction block was. We met the uh, priest of this church. And it's such an amazing uh, thing because he's from Sierra Leone pastoring an African-American congregation. Very, very, very unusual. In fact, all of his um, associates in seminary said, why would you do that? That's crazy. An inner city church like that. And he said, I want to do it for the challenge. He's just a very sweet believer. And the Anacostia Arts Project that we talked about over at uh, Southeast White House started in this, this building. When we were doing the painting, uh, I got to know the priest and our church, my church in um, Fairfax, developed a relationship with them and we did things back and forth with each other. This church plays a big part in the story of Anacostia. When this church, they were having trouble, they were renovating this old building and in the basement they were having water problems and they discovered there was an underground spring under the church. And it turns out that, that that spring was where the slaves were kept before they were auctioned off in the block. And it was, there was a fence and there was a spring so they'd have water. So the story of Anacostia is in places of infamy, there are places of blessing now. Uh, <clears throat> around this Freedom Square there are five different churches reaching out to the community. The other thing is there's a church across the street and that was actually the auctioneer's house. So it's, it's such a wonderful historical story and very few people in Anacostia ever do that. This is a photograph of the Corpus of Christ from Orvieto, Italy. My daughter Rachel spent a semester studying in, um, in Orvieto and some of the professors are from Siva and Christian professors and it was sponsored by um, Gordon College although she didn't go to Gordon. This was found in, they were in a convent, and this was found in the basement of the convent. It's a very, very early Corpus of Christ with the crown of thorns, and it's, um, it's unique in that it can be Christ in repose, and then the arms go up and it can be like a crucifixion. So it could be hung on the wall with a crucifixion form, and then they come down like this. It's very rare. And I, um, the shadows and the image is just so powerful. And we had, um, she was asked to do a large exhibition at Calvary St. George's Episcopal Church in New York, a giant Anglo-Catholic church, beautiful old building. And we did this in the chapel, and this was on the altar in the chapel for, for Good Friday and for Holy Week. 